people ask me, they said, why do you, I've, I've, I'm a, I'm a Cold War historian, a historian of communism, different ideologies and so forth. And friends of mine emailed me and said, why do you want to tackle this issue, right? Marriage and family and, and you're, you're jumping into the culture war. Why do you, do you really want to do this? And no, I mean, it's not fun being called all kinds of nasty names, right? For supporting basically what, you know, 99.99% .99 of people have uh, their views of marriage and family over the last 2000 years. But to put your neck out there on the line and get attacked for this, it's not fun. I'd rather not do this. But it's precisely because of my background in these areas, you know, lecturing over and over and over again on the Communist Manifesto and Marx and Marx's views on family and Engels on family, that I did have to write this because I come to this from a historical, ideological perspective as someone who studied the intellectual history, the, the ideological history. All right, so that being the case, I have a PowerPoint presentation, which my students know I never do. I mean, I, I've, it's always talk and chalk, and I fill the board with, with chalk. But a, a really good student of mine put together this fabulous PowerPoint presentation. And as long as I can press the buttons correctly, I think I'll be all right in, in doing this. All right, so take down the radical left's assault on the family. This is, this is based on my book, Take Down, which came out just, just a few months ago. And it is out in electronic form as well as hard copy. And I dedicate this, as it says on the screen, to those with the courage to resist, redefining the teachings of God, nature, their faith, and their ancestors, while liberals and progressives, in the name of tolerance, in the name of tolerance, denounce, debase, dehumanize, uh, demonize, and seek to destroy them. And you know this is what happens with, when you disagree with the forces of tolerance and diversity on issues of marriage and family. They seek to destroy you. And so I dedicate uh, the book to, to the people who are willing to, to, uh, to stick, to have the courage to stick to the teachings of God, nature, and their ancestors. Started with a quote from Pope Francis of all things. January 16, 2015, in the Philippines, and I love this quote. It fits so perfectly with, with the history that, that, I, that I lay out lay out in the book. There are forms of ideological colonization which are out to destroy the family. Think about that term, ideological colonization. That's really very good. It really describes what, what we're facing here. They are not born of dreams, of prayers of closeness to God or the mission which God gave us. They come from without. The family is threatened by growing efforts on the part to redefine the very institution of marriage by relativism, by the culture of the ephemeral. Every threat to the family is a threat to society itself. It's absolutely right. You know, one thing that conservatives, you take the spectrum of conservatives to communists agree on is the absolute and utterly and fundamental importance of the family, which is why conservatives want to preserve and conserve it and which is why the most radical leftists have always sought to change it, right? There's nothing more fundamental than the family. Every threat to the family is a threat to society itself. The future of humanity passes through the family, said Pope Francis. I've written an, an article recently in, in response to Francis's trip to the United States called Cherry Picking Pope Francis, which I wrote for The Hill, so you could find it online, read a little bit more about his, his views on marriage and family, which are very misunderstood. Okay, so let's go through the history of this. Karl Marx, there's this phrase in the Communist Manifesto. I mean, my students actually read the Communist Manifesto. All right, yeah, but nothing bothers me more than, than you, when you run, and I run into this all the time out on the road, and you know, young people especially come up to me and say, well, you know, the Communist Manifesto is really a pretty good book if you just stop and read it. It talks about sharing and helping your, your, your fellow, human, your, helping humanity, and, and, and I know that as soon as I've heard that, that they haven't actually read the Communist Manifesto, because if you read it, it's an awful book. And it doesn't take long to get through it. It's short. In fact, go to Marxist.org and get it online for free. Read Marx's 10-point plan. But he talks about, in fact, he says, the entire theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, uh, uh, abolition of private property. And right there, I mean, my five-year-old daughter can tell you that if you're going to abolish private property, you're going to have to kill people. 
And Marx even says, well, of course, in order for this to happen, you know, despotism will be necessary, at least for a time. Marx knew that. You'd have to be an idiot to, to not realize that to abolish private property that you're going to have to use force. But there's a line in there that always jumps out on my students. Abolition of the family! <laughs> Exclamation mark. Even the most radical flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. So Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto in 1848 could already at that point in time not only talk about abolition of the family, but refer to it as that infamous proposal of the communists. So apparently it had been infamous already in 1840. So again, the, you know, my students will say, Professor, what does that mean? What exactly does that mean? I spent about two chapters walking through that very, very carefully, giving some of the pros and cons, citing different, different scholars on that. But I'll move on. I'll come back to it. Even before Marx, there were ideological colonists who were out to redefine marriage and family. A couple of them, a number of them, Charles Fourier, Robert Owen, John Humphrey Noyes, some of them were American, others were foreign born, but they all tried to set up different ideological colonies in the United States in the 1800s. So this idea of redefining family and marriage, although it's accelerated in the last 200 years, especially since the 1800s, is nothing new. John Humphrey Noyes attempted to do this, Robert Owen, the Oneida colony, as it was called in New York, the New Harmony colony in, in Indiana, Right? These people all sought to redefine and reshape the traditional understanding of one man, one woman marriage. Marriage-based family, a family with one, with one man, one dad, right, one mother. So that they were all trying to change this. Robert Owen stood atop his New Harmony colony on July 4th, 1826. You guys never heard of this, right? What happened on July 4th, 1826? 50th anniversary of Declaration of Independence, right? John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, taking their final breaths, literally dying. Countries celebrating America's jubilee and, you know, everyone in America all excited. While this is going on, you've got this great document that they're celebrating, the Declaration of Independence. Robert Owen, a socialist, was standing up and proclaiming his Declaration of Mental Independence. And he said... Quote, I now declare to you and to the world that man up to this hour has been in all parts of the earth a slave, a slave to a trinity of the most monstrous evils that could be combined to inflict mental and physical evil upon the whole race. What's he talking about? A trinity of the most monstrous evils ever inflicted. Whoa, I got to read more. I refer to private property, absurd and irrational systems of religion and marriage, founded upon individual property, combined with some of these irrational systems of religion. So property, religion, marriage. Here in America, 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, all of these ideas are always swirling around. Always. All chipping away. All chipping away. We ignore them at our peril. And I would say at our willful, self-imposed ignorance and blindness. Some people don't want to see this stuff. The people that are going to email me and call me names, right? Don't even want, they're angry that I'm even going into this. Marx and Engels. It is not possible to speak of the family, as they put it. Marx wrote to Engels, blessed is he who has no family. Blessed is he who has no family. Some think that when he said that, it was partly in jest because he was complaining, which he was, about his financial situation. But if you know about Marx's relations with his wife, and his children, Marx had a very, very, very bad family life. All right, Marx was not a good husband and father. Several of his kids died before he did. At least a couple of them committed suicide. One of the daughters committed suicide in a suicide pact with her husband, Marx's son-in-law, who Marx denigrated with the most awful racist language because the son-in-law was part Cuban. So he had Cuban blood in him, which Marx saw as an inferior type of blood. Uh, Marx was Marx cheated on his wife with a family nursemaid to whom he seems to have impregnated. Marx would never acknowledge the existence of the child or that the child was his. As for Engels, he loved that idea. Blessed is he who has no family. He said, right on, comrade. 
right? Uh, Ingalls refused to get married. Ingalls had several mistresses, all of which wanted him to make honest women out of them, and he refused to marry them. Didn't like it. He disliked marriage so much he didn't get married. Abolition of the family, bourgeois marriage. Here's one of their quotes, Marx and Ingalls. Bourgeois marriage is in reality a system of housewives held in common, a system of wives in common. The communist revolution, they wrote in the Communist Manifesto, is the most radical rupture with traditional relations. No wonder that its development involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. These guys wanted to fundamentally transform marriage, our notions of property, religion, everything else. Do you charge us with wanting to stop the exploitation of children by their parents? To this crime, we plead guilty. But you will say we destroy the most hallowed of relations when we replace home education by social. If you look at the 10, 10th point in the 10 point plan of Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, it calls for free public education for all children in public schools. They did not want children being educated at home or in churches or religious schools. They wanted children educated in public schools. Marx fulminated against the bourgeois claptrap about the family and education. All right, let me move on here. They also hated, what they hated the most is what was hated the most by Robert Owen. Religion, private property, family and marriage. And of course, Marx called religion the what? Opiate of the masses, the opiate of the masses. He also said, communism begins where atheism begins, Marx said. Lenin especially despised religion. Lenin said, all worship of a divinity is a necrophilia. Google that one. See what necrophilia means. All worship of a, divi of a divinity is a necrophilia. I'm, I'm, aren't you thankful that you don't have any quotes like that from Washington or Lincoln or Jefferson? That's the founder of the Soviet state. Lenin wrote to Maxim Gorky in 1913, there can be nothing more abominable than religion. Nothing more abominable than religion. Compared religion to venereal disease. He's trying to think, what's the worst thing out there? That you, I got a necrophilia, venereal disease. Ah, that's religion, right? That's religion. Friedrich Engels. So what in his, um, what, a year after Marx died, he and Engels wrote together as posthumous a year after uh, Marx's death. But Engels said this is the book that uh, the Marx wanted to write. They wrote a book on, on the family, and Ingalls says in there, with the transfer of the means of production into common ownership, the, fingle, the, the single family ceases to be the economic unit of society. So what did Ingalls want to do? Private housekeeping should be transformed into a social industry. Wanted to nationalize private housekeeping. The care and education of children becomes a public affair, Society looks after all children alike, whether they are legitimate or not. Alexandra Kolonte, who was one of the leading feminists of the Bolshevik Revolution. Anybody ever read Alexandra Kolonte? No, we should. I mean, 100 years ago, she was you know, the leading feminist of, 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 the, of the Bolshevik Revolution. Kind of, a, kind of a Soviet Eleanor Roosevelt, right? Alexandra Kolonte. And she said here... The old type of family has had its day. The worker mother must learn not to differentiate between yours and mine. The worker mother must remember that there are only our children, the children of Russia's communist workers. Communist society will take it upon itself, all the duties involved in the education of the child. Now, I'm juxtaposing that next to a quote from Melissa Harris Perry. All right, Melissa Harris Perry, very well educated. Duke, Princeton, Wake Forest, right? Very strong academic pedigree. She's on MSNBC. She's part of the Lean Forward campaign. She's one of the leading intellectual progressives today. And she made this statement a couple of years ago. Look how close it sounds to what Alexandra Colante said. We have never invested as much in public education as we should because we've always had this kind of private notion of children. She doesn't like that. We haven't had a very collective notion of our children. We have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families. 
and recognize the kids belong to whole communities. When I had to go and find that quote for the book, I was looking for a source to cite, and among the other places where I found it posted was Fox News website, and I was reading the readers' comments from, from different people who chimed in and said, I've never seen anything like this before. This is crazy. This, where is she coming up with this? I've never heard the idea that you know our, our children don't belong to us. They belong to society. Well, it's not new at all. <laughs> Alexandra Colante and, and the Bolsheviks and... And, and Ingalls, they've been talking about this stuff for 120, 130, 140 years. This isn't new. Not new at all. What's new is that there's now a progressive movement in America where people will advocate these things and become spokespeople for the movement with, with wide public support. That's what's new. In a lot of things, and I show this again and again in the book, in so many of the, of the things that today's progressive movement supports, they're just 50 to 100 years behind what the Bolsheviks supported. And I don't mean that across the board, gulagging people and so forth. You know, okay, all right. But as you'll see, on abortion, divorce, redefining the family, um, you know, education, not educating children at home, on a lot of these things, right? Not in 100 out of 100 issues, but on, on a number of, of quite remarkable issues. All right, American communists, Bella Dodd and Whitaker Chambers, they talked about the Communist Party and marriage in the United States. So this is Communist Party USA, right? Bella Dodd, she, a member of CPUSA, the party did all it could to push women into industry. The bourgeois family as a social unit was to be made obsolete. I often talked of adopting children, but the comrades dissuaded me. Communism is an all-embracing philosophy which embraces everything you do, which determines the kind of marriage that you have, your relations with your children, your relationship to your community, your relationship with your profession. Whitaker Chambers, the great convert out of communism to eventually conservatism, talked about party marriages, a communist marriage. And a communist marriage was usually a marriage that certainly wasn't done in a church, wasn't in any way sacramentalized and was very often temporary. They had huge rates of divorce, many, many of these folks. You know, long before, before we have high divorce levels in the United States today. Chambers said as of the communists, they regarded marriage as a bourgeois convention and they loathed it with the same intensity with which many middle-class persons loathe sin. Anti-marriage. Divorce in communist Russia, I'll go through this real quick. I got a bunch of different bullet points. But one of the first things that the Bolsheviks did in Russia was legalize divorce. I mean, if, if, you, if you wanted to own pri private property, if you wanted freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, if you wanted a fur coat, if you wanted a bank account, all this stuff, all of that, the state got in the way. But baby, if you wanted a divorce, sky was the limit. You were the freest person in the world. Here's a card, fill it out, put a postage stamp on it, take it down, you got it. We'll make this easy. There won't be any bureaucratic state obstacles getting in the way of your divorce. You want a divorce? Go. Go, 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 go. State won't get in the way. And very, very, very soon, within 10, 15 years, they saw divorce rates in communist Bolshevik Russia that we had literally never seen before. I mean, people, I cite in the book one example, a, a, a study from the late 1960s, and this is published in a book by Harvard University Press, the seminal book on marriage and family life in, in, in uh, communist Russia. The quote, it was not unusual, unquote, to meet Soviet men and women who'd been married and divorced upwards of 15 times. Upwards of 15 times. The Atlantic in 1926, published a piece titled The Russian Effort to Abolish Marriage. Remember Marx, abolition of the family, right? Exclamation mark. If divorce was an epidemic in the USSR, abortion was the, was it, was the black plague. The other thing that the Russians made sure that the Bolsheviks said this is going to be really easy to do. If you want an abortion, <laughs> Go. There are, there are no state obstacles. Full privatization. You want an abortion? Go get it. Lenin had written as early as 1913, he promised an unconditional annulment of all laws against abortion. 
Bolshevik Revolution, of course, was in what year? 1917. By 1920, abortion was made fully and legally available and provided free of charge. By 1934, Moscow women were having three abortions for every live birth. We've never been that bad in the United States. I think it's flipped for us, one to three the other way. Three to one by 1934, there's that many. Abortion got so bad in Bolshevik Russia that Stalin had to ban it. Not because Stalin was any greater promoter of a culture of life, but Stalin said, we're not, we're not gonna have a population 50 to 100 years if this, if this goes on. This is just, and by the way, you should see Stalin was reprimanded by Trotsky, who was in exile at that point. Trotsky's like, you can't be a good communist and abolish abortion. What are you, what are you, what are you doing? I mean, you know, come on. But Stalin's, we're not going to have a population if, if this keeps up. Stalin died March 5th, 1953. He's eventually replaced by Khrushchev. One of the first things that Khrushchev did, as well as a kind of cracking down on religion even stronger, was brought back abortion. Because again, you can't be a good communist. And, and, and not have abortion. And so by the late 1960s, quote, again, Harvard University Press book, one can find Soviet women who've had as many as 20 abortions. By the 1970s, the USSR was averaging seven to eight million abortions per year. Our worst year is of Roe v. Wade. We were one to one and a half million. Seven to eight million per year. By the year uh, 2050, that's a misprint, by the year 2050, Russia, and there was a great Washington Post piece on this a few years ago. The, the, the Russia was looking at a population plunge from 140 million to 104 million, which they attributed to abortion and abortion-induced fertility from women having too many abortions. Vladimir Putin has actually put the first major limits on abortion in Russia in decades because he realizes, among other things, this is a disappearing population. Of, I mean, Putin, the Russians are doing national fertility days to, to, try, to try to get more children in Russia. All right, I'll skip that. Margaret Sanger. I have a chapter in the book on Margaret Sanger. She's been in the news as of late. She's the founder of Planned Parenthood which began as the ABCL, the American Birth Control League. Margaret Sanger took a pilgrimage to Russia in 1934. Like many American, I call them Potemkin progressives. I have a, a couple chapters in my book, Dupes, on Potemkin progressives. George Bernard Shaw, um, the, why can't, why can't I think of it? She, Margaret Sanger had an affair with him. The H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells. Uh, John Dewey, founding father of an American public education. I've got several chapters on him in, in dupes. They would make these pilgrimages to Russia because they're, th they're all progressives. They're all on the left. Some of them are socialists. Some of them are Fabian socialists. Some of them are Communist Party USA sympathizers, have CPUSA friends. And they're thinking, well, you know, maybe the Bolsheviks are just a little bit ahead of us. The Bolsheviks want revolution. We're talking evolution, right? And maybe, you know, maybe the, let's go see what they're doing over there. So Sanger goes over in 1934 to see if she can learn any lessons from the Bolsheviks on birth control. At this point in time, Sanger wrote a piece that I share with my students in The Nation, January 1932. She, she was not at least publicly on record in support of abortion. She, she wanted uh, Planned Parenthood in order to have birth control for women to be able to space births, control the number of births, for eugenics, racial eugenics, right? We know about her Negro project and some of the other very distasteful stuff on her, ra racially speaking. She wanted, uh, she wanted people, she also wanted birth control for sexual freedom for women, which she herself pretty vigorously engaged in. Again, she had an affair with H.G. Wells while, while, she, while, she, while she was married. But Sanger at that point in time said, when people say that we want birth control, we want it for purposes of abortion, we do not. She said, there is nothing more dangerous that, than the aborting of a woman's offspring. We do not support abortion. We condemn it in the strongest terms. Of course, about 80 years after that statement, now her Planned Parenthood not only supports abortion, right, but wants federal funding for it. And if you're against them getting federal funding, well, you favor a war on women. So the progressives had to evolve on, on that position. But so Sanger goes to Russia in 1934, 
to see what she can learn from the Bolsheviks on, <laughs> on, on birth control. And she came back and she wrote an article in the Birth Control Review, 1935. She said this, in Russia, Bolshevik Russia, the mother and the child are under the protection and care of the government to an extent perhaps never before equaled in history. And then she said this, everybody listen very carefully to this. This is Margaret Sanger on Bolshevik Russia. Theoretically, there are no obstacles to birth control in Russia. It is, it is accepted on the grounds of health and human rights. We, America, could well take example from Russia. That would be Stalin's Soviet Union. This is 1934. This is on the verge of the Great Purge. All right? We could well take example from Russia, wrote the founder of Planned Parenthood where there are no legal restrictions, no religious condemnation, and where birth control instruction is part of the regular welfare service of the government. That's where we are in America in 2015. Birth control instruction is part of the regular welfare service of the government. We want no legal restrictions, no religious condemnation. And if you don't support birth control being part of the regular welfare service of the government, <laughs> why you troglodyte. You favor a war on women. So again, we're just 80 years behind what Sanger saw in Bolshevik Russia. She said this on abortion. She was, however, to her credit, to Margaret Sanger's credit, she was aghast at the number of abortions that she was seeing in Moscow. This was, this was horrible. And she said this, the total is, number is not known. But the number for Moscow alone is roughly estimated at 100,000 per year. She had that right. She was given correct information on that. And now listen to this. Here is a picture of progressive utopianism. Listen to what she says here. But, right, all the officials with whom I discussed the matter, that is the very high number of abortions in Moscow, stated that as soon as the economic and social plans of Soviet Russia are realized, Neither abortions nor contraception will be necessary or desired. A functioning communistic society will assure the happiness of every child and will assume the full responsibility for its welfare and education. So if they just had more power, don't worry. Give us more communism, give us more state control, and abortion and contraception, it won't even be necessary. Right? The full faith of the progressive the utopian faith in centralized government. Moving on from Sanger. All right, we've got to jump ahead here. The, where you really start to get serious change in understanding of marriage and family and sexuality and gender. It's not with Communist Party USA. It's not with the traditional communists, all right? Uh, a lot of them, those, a lot of those people tended to be, you know, I guess what we call today more socially conservative, even though they were radical and other things. I walk through all that in the book. But the, the big change comes with the cultural Marxists of the Frankfurt School. And there are people in America that are, will be Googling right now and wondering, uh, does this even exist? Yeah. The Frankfurt School out of Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. These were cultural Marxists. They were Freudian Marxists. They very, very, very shrewdly understood that they were not going to be able to take down the West through economic class-based Marxism. Because when Marxism was put up against capitalism in the West, it's gonna lose every time. And you know, the most, the most liberal American, right, knows that the free market outperforms because they live it, they experience it every day. It's gonna outperform communism and socialism. So these guys said the key to taking down the West is through culture and especially through sexuality, gender, and through the conveyor belts of media, movies, Hollywood, New York, and especially, especially, especially academia, academia, academia. That's the key, the long, slow march through the institutions. They fused Marxism with Freudianism. And these guys began changing and messing with and, and trying to alter gender, sexuality, sexual relations, argue that people were fully capable of bisexuality. From a very young age, people were fully capable 
of uh, premarital sex, extramarital sex later, smashing monogamy. Actually, the original, one of the original preachers of smashing monogamy was Ingalls, long before the 1960s New Left picked it up. But the cultural Marxist, George Lukács was one of the founders. Cultural commissar, Hungarian communist, 1910s. One of the founders at the Marx Ingalls Institute. George Lukács said, woman is the enemy. By the way, needless to say, girls, that uh, most of these guys didn't have good marriages. Woman is the enemy. Healthy love dies in marriage, which is a business transaction. The bourgeois family gives off swamp vapors. The bourgeois family gives off swamp vapors. The traditional family stinks. Politics is only the means, said George Lukács. Culture is the goal. So there were a bunch of these Freudian Marxists. They end up being, they end up needing to flee Berlin because many of them were Jewish. And when Hitler came in and took Germany and his madness, they were, they were forced to flee Berlin. Now there's very few places in the world that were willing to accept kind of fugitive freaks of Freudian Marxism. I mean, what college is gonna roll out the red carpet for that? But there was one, Columbia University. And, and John Dewey, in particular, lobbied the school president, along with a number of other Potemkin progressives and socialists, and said, these guys are doing fabulous work. Yeah, bring them here to the United States. Bring them to Columbia. And, and, and Dewey also is thinking, John Dewey is honorary president for life of the National Education Association. And Dewey's thinking, these guys can do fabulous work through my NEA. And uh, they can also do wonderful work through Columbia Teachers College, which was the, the preeminent teachers college in the United States at, at, at the time. One of the Freudian Marxists was Wilhelm Reich. I have a full chapter on him and take down, it's scandalous. I mean, the guy was sexually completely out of control at a very, very young age. You know, trying to have sex in bed with his nanny when he's like, you know, really young. You know, not like 10 or 12, <laughs> like six, seven, eight years old. Chronic, oh, I don't want to say this stuff on TV. Uh, just, just the things he did to himself sexually were very un unusual. Wilhelm Reich said this, marriages fall to pieces as a result of the ever deepening discrepancy between sexual needs and economic conditions. Wilhelm Reich wrote the book, The Sexual Revolution. Sexual needs can be gratified with one and the same partner for a limited time only, right? Guys, tell that to your, to your wives, right? I'm sorry, honey, but my sexual needs can be gratified from you for only a limited time only. So you know, I need to move on here. It's time to smash this monogamous relationship. The result, this results in the wretchedness of marriage. Wilhelm Reich, divorced. Herbert Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse was the most influential of the Frankfurt School of Cultural Marxists, a kind of intellectual guru to the new left in America. The Weather Underground, SDS, Bernardine Dorn, Bill Ayers, Mark Rudd, Tom Hayden, these people read Marcuse, okay? Extremely influential, taught at about a half a dozen different institutions, Harvard, Columbia, of course, and, and, and a bunch of others. Marcuse talked about polymorphous perversity, which was sexuality that included, I'll just read it, oral, anal, and genital eroticism, that eschews a narrow focus on hetero, heterosexual intercourse. Marcuse believed that sexual liberation was achieved by exploring new permutations of sexual desire, sexual activities, and gender roles. So you see here, what I'm taking you through is the change over time on the radical far left, right? Traditional Marxist culture. You see, it's all, it's all gonna culminate to where we are today. All of this stuff, helps take us to where we are today. What Freud called perverse sexual desires, that is non-reproductive non forms of sexual behavior. Non-reproductive forms. Again, not just with the same, not just with the opposite sex. 
Marcuse continued, Marcuse was himself heterosexual, but he identified the homosexual as the radical standard bearer of sex for the sake of pleasure. Dennis Altman's book, Homosexual Oppression and Liberation, 1971, quotes uh, Marcuse on polymorphous perversity. Anatomy, Altman noted, has forced the homosexual to explore the realities of polymorphous eroticism. Again, a lot of details here, but it's changing. One last thing on Marcuse, who's cited by the Red Butterfly Collective, a Marxist faction of the Gay Liberation Front. They stressed his ideas on, on gay liberation in the Gay Manifesto. But, what, but one thing, because i got to move on, I'm up against the clock. Uh, Marcuse talked about liberating tolerance or repressive tolerance. Think about this. It's very, very important because you see this on the left all the time today. Marcuse argued, right, that intolerance, exact quote, I want to get the exact quote. Quote, he argued, he urged intolerance against movements from the right and toleration of movements from the left, unquote. That's where the left is today. If they disagree with your ideas, right, then they don't extend toleration to you. They tolerate only what they want to tolerate. It's a selective tolerance. By the way, when you only tolerate the things that you agree with, that's not tolerance. All right? It's really easy to tolerate only the things you agree with. Okay? Tolerance is where, is where you say, you know, I totally disagree with you. I even hate your ideas. But, you know, we live in a, in a diverse country and I'll, you know, respect your right to have a different point of view. I won't sue you or shut you down or throw you in jail. But Marcuse and these guys are arguing for repressive tolerance, not tolerating ideas from the right. And here's what's fascinating. If you support the concept of male-female-based marriage, which has been the position of 99.99999% of humanity for the last 2,000 years, you're now on the right. And so you shouldn't be tolerated. Marcuse. New left, is, uh, new left Marxist feminist, Betty Friedan's 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique. So here you go into, uh, Betty Friedan was a Marxist. Okay. I, I, I found an acknowledgement on that on one of the websites. It was like a fact check thing. And it said, yeah, she was a Marxist. And the, and the comments and response were, who cares if she's a Marxist? What are you, Joe McCarthy? Right. Anyway, she said that uh, suburban homesteads of American housewives were, quote, akin to, com to comfortable concentration camps, unquote, a comment that she had, to, she had to walk back. One of the scholars of Betty Friedan, he's really good. He's on the left. He's a very good scholar. And he notes portions of the feminine mystique that were taken from the Ingalls book that I quoted earlier on Origins of the Family that actually in the draft of one of the early versions of her book of, of The Feminine Mystique, she's, she's taking notes there and incorporating ideas from, from Ingalls. So it's not McCarthyism to point out she's a communist. You have to understand that she was a communist to understand where some of these ideas come from, right? Kate Millett. Kate Millett, also one of the founders of the National Organization for Women along with Betty Friedan, she wrote the book Sexual Politics, okay? She argued in there, and she would go on to argue, not only for, um, again, non-monogamous marriage, but also for bisexuality, sex with the opposite, and, and today she supports same-sex marriage. She wrote in Sexual Politics, a sexual revolution would require, perhaps first of all, an end of traditional sexual inhibitions and taboos, particularly those that most threaten patriarchal, monogamous marriage, homosexuality, illegitimacy, adolescent, and pre- and extramarital sexuality. By the way, my wife is not patriarchal, right? She's a woman, and she totally supports monogamous marriage, okay? It's just, it isn't just something the guys support, all right? Patriarchal, monogamous marriage. This is Mallory Millett on her sister, Kate, talking about attending a group in 1969 with uh, Kate, where it's kind of a, there are students there from Columbia, all very highly educated women. 
and she said, Mallory, who's today a conservative, she said that they went into a kind of like a litany that they recited. A litany is a prayer in the Catholic Church where you kind of repeat certain things over and over again. Why are we here today? She asked. To make revolution, they answered. What kind of revolution? They replied. The cultural revolution, they chanted. And how do we make cultural revolution? She demanded. By destroying the American family, they answered. How do we destroy the American family? They answered back. This is Mallory, Kate's sister. She was there. By destroying the American patriarch. And how do we destroy the American patriarch? By taking away his power. How do we do that? By destroying monogamy. How do we destroy monogamy? By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, pro uh, prostitution, homosexuality. Goes on and on and on. I won't go through the whole thing. But, uh, but again, this is, I'm explaining to you the trajectory, the history. You don't go directly from Marx and, and Robert Owen to the same-sex marriage, right? You go, you go through cultural Marxism, New Left, Marcuse, all these different things. Here are some of the different people from the smashing, the New Left in the 1960s, they were cultural Marxists. They picked up the smashing monogamy theme. Mark Rudd, Bernardine Dorn, Bill Ayers, the Red Family Collective, started in the Berkeley Hills by Robert Shear and Tom Hayden, who had married Jane Fonda. The Red Family Collective. All right, again, experimenting with non-monogamous marriage, multiple partners, group marriages, right? all, of, all of this different stuff. Mark Rudd, we blank on all your conventional values, he said, was the way that they thought back then. There were no limits to our politics of transgression. There were no limits to our politics of transgression. They did uh, smashing monogamy. P older folks will know this was this was a motto of the Weather Underground. In fact, the the women's collective in the Weather Underground. This is in Larry Grathwell's book, Bringing Down America. He was an eyewitness. He had penetrated the Weather Underground, and he said the the, the members of the women's collective argued that men were totally unnecessary, including for sex. You didn't need men. You didn't need them for a woman. Didn't need a man for sex either. So they're so they're 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 changing all of this stuff. Bill Ayers talks about in his September 11th, 2001 published interview in the New York Times. September 11th, 2001 talks about and Rudd talks about this too. They 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 said that there should not only be monogamous couples, right? They didn't want you to have monogamous marriage or monogamous. They also wanted everybody to try to experiment in bisexuality and homosexuality. And Rudd, Rudd couldn't do it. He tried a couple of times with his buddy to have sex with him. Just couldn't do it. Didn't work for him. And it's, it's amazing to read this. Rudd blames it on cultural taboos and inhibitions. You know, come, come on, Mark, maybe you're just you're biologically just not attracted to somebody of the same sex. But it, see, the, the Marxist blames it on culture. Right, blames us on boy. The culture's got us all screwed up. You know, I get, I'm not even turned on by, by my by my naked buddy here. Um, the culture's really got us screwed up, right? Bill Ayers, on the other hand, said that he tried to have sex with um, his male best friend and did. And so, so you know, he was apparently capable. But the ideology compelled them to 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 this action, to try to take down the traditional family, smashing monogamy. Uh, the, the publisher of Tacoon, somebody help me, the politics of meaning guy, Michael Lerner, who was um, Hillary Clinton's politics of guru guy in the 1990s. Um, Michael Lerner, editor of Tacoon, the Jewish spiritual magazine. I think he's a rabbi, very liberal, very leftist rabbi. He's now in the same-sex marriage movement as well. He was a student of Marcuse, Marcuse. And he talks about when he got married, having a wedding cake that said smashing that said smash monogamy on it and he and his wife exchanged wedding rings that were hammered out of down fuselages from american aircraft shot down in vietnam rudd also had one of those rings that he wore so they exchanged and according to david horowitz the uh, michael lerner's um fiance the wife that he married was the daughter of a conservative like military man and so here they are exchanging uh, you know, rings from, from downed aircraft in Vietnam over a cake that says smashing monogamy. And uh, their marriage lasted a year. Because this, this violates 
this stuff, not just biblical law, but natural law. In fact, Rudd said, we lost a lot of really good people in, uh, in, in the weather underground because some of the guys and girls were in love and didn't want other partners. They wanted to be faithful to each other. But that went against the code, right? Taking down the traditional family and marriage. I've got to move quicker here. All right, communists and homosexuality. Um, communists, especially the, especially the old guard, CPUSA, they were not pushing homosexuality. They were not pushing same-sex marriage. Again, that really comes with, with, with the new left and the cultural Marx. Even the cultural Marxists weren't pushing same-sex marriage. I mean, nobody was pushing. No matter how extreme... How far to the left you got? Marcuse or Reich? None of those guys were talking about same-sex marriage. I mean, that would have struck the most extreme of these guys as incomprehensible. But uh, homosexuality, the Communist Party USA, they weren't pushing this. A couple of um, cases, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was tarred and feathered and smeared and called, made fun of by communists. They portrayed him as a cross-dresser. As in those days, they called it transvestite. I mean, they when the left doesn't like you, man, they could be the worst, biggest homophobes on the planet. All right, so they really went after J. Edgar Hoover, Harry Hay. Harry Hay is the most prominent uh, gay communist pioneer, and you know I've read his memoir and the leading biography of him. It's fascinating. Uh, Harry Hay was, the take is that he was expelled from the communist movement because he was homosexual. Um, I, I, I think it looks more like he left because he knew that it would cause Communist Party USA problems if he stayed in as a homosexual. And he even says that Communist Party USA did look the other way on certain homosexuals when those homosexuals were useful to Communist Party USA. Will Gear, who played Grandpa Walton on The Waltons, was the gay lover of Harry Hay, who brought Harry Hay into the communist orbit. So Harry Hay had always been, he would say, homosexual, but he was drawn into the communist movement by Will Gear. By Will Gear. All right, here's the fascinating thing, and this is what compelled me to stick my neck out and make a lot of people hate me for writing this book and even talking about this subject. I started noticing a few years ago, I read every day People's World, which is the website. It is the successor publication to The Daily Worker. The Daily Worker was the Soviet-directed and funded mouthpiece of Communist Party USA for you know, practically a century. People's World is the successor. I read that every day. I read Communist Party USA's website, cpusa.org, because, again, this is my field. I can't be ignorant of what people – I don't just – make up things about with the comment I read, right? I read with it, which is interesting because the left I find doesn't usually read the right. I'll get all kinds of nasty emails on, on this presentation from people who will not read this book. They won't read it. I'm reading Harry Hayes books. <laughs> I read all of their stuff. All right. I read their stuff. That's called true open-mindedness. Okay. That that's called real diversity and real tolerance when you actually read the other side and consider what they have to say. Right? When you completely banish the other side and want to find them and throw them in jail and demonize them, that's not real tolerance. So anyway, I started noticing a few years ago that um, American communists were very supportive of same-sex marriage. And I quote in the book a 2006 statement from the Young Communist League on Gay Pride Month. Communists stand in solidarity. The month of June has been designated as Pride Month in celebration of the struggles and achievements of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the United States. In 2006, we still have a long way to go. That really struck me. And then I started noticing about three years ago, I started noticing really strong, staunch pieces in support of same-sex marriage um, in speeches by like people like Sam Webb, at People's World every week, all the time. Last June, the most recent June, they uh, People's World really celebrated uh, uh, Gay Rights Month. They've become they become some of the strongest supporters of same-sex marriage, and I was puzzled by. It. I thought, wow, they're not just mildly supportive of it; they are intense advocates of, of this. 
Why is Communist Party USA so, so on board for game? I'm not making this up. You are literally far more likely to find the colors of the rainbow flag at the website of People's World than a red flag or a hammer and sickle. Because they do a pretty good job of actually not totally using the word communist. But they are really out, out there on, on supporting the, the full total LGBT agenda. And those that are against it, they really go after. You should have seen, you should have seen how they went after the state of Indiana on the Indiana religious freedom thing. I mean, the communists hammered them, raked them over the coals. So they are 100% on the full LGBT bandwagon. Then what really blew me away, I've been lecturing on Castro's Cuba for years. And you know, again, my background is communism, right? The, the communist movement, international, domestic. Fidel Castro was the world's biggest homophobe. Fidel Castro threw gay people in insane asylums, in nut houses, right? That was one of the least gay-friendly places on the planet. Well, well, now, and I'll just quote a couple of different things here, the May 10, 2012 Huffington Post, some 400 transvestites sashayed behind Castro in Havana, doing a conga line through the streets to celebrate the fifth Cuban day against homophobia. Really? They all get thrown in jail? No, 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 no. The regime supports this. The fifth uh, observed elsewhere, uh, marchers shouted, down with homophobia, long live sexual diversity. Mary Ella Castro, Fidel's niece, says of Fidel, he has done some advocacy work, gay advocacy work. Speaking of the need to make progress in terms of rights based on sexual orientation and gender identity, they are, um, why is Castro's? Cuba on, 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 bo on board for same-sex marriage. Now, what's going on here? So to, to me, this all makes sense when you take it back to the original communist goal, especially when you're talking about Communist Party USA and you're talking about Castro's Cuba, of abolition of the family, uh, of, of communism being the most radical rupture in traditional relations. Right? For, for them, this all comes together. For them, same-sex marriage gives them the tool that they've been looking for for a couple hundred years, where at long last, for the first time ever in the history of the far left, they've got a tool to reshape family and marriage that the mainstream population supports. So this is perfect for them to do what they want to do. And let me say this so clearly, this doesn't mean that same-sex marriage is a communist plot or was given to us by the communists. That's stupid. No one is saying that. And it doesn't mean that the typical same-sex marriage supporter is a communist. They're not. They're obviously not. All right, maybe 1% of the American population is, is communist. What, what it does mean, though, is, is that the communists are thrilled with the same-sex marriage movement because it's given them a chance to do what they've always wanted to do which is go against the natural, traditional, biblical definition of, of, of marriage and family. I mean, they've been waiting for so long for this, and they, they finally have it. And I would add, too, remember, what, what do communists hate more than the family? Religion. This is an outstanding tool for the communists to hammer religious believers. I mean, when they see a Kim Davis thrown in jail, oh, they love that. Right? When they see the baker being persecuted for um, not being fined, the Kleins in Oregon being fined for not wanting to be forced to make a cake for a wedding that they believe violates their religious beliefs, when they see them being shut down and attacked for that, the communists love it. I mean, they absolutely love this. This, you know, this is the common, this is what, this is what, they've, what they've wanted to do. All right, just a couple final things here, and then I'll wrap up and take some questions. There are groups out there, including the group Beyond Same-Sex Marriage, and they are looking, uh, they have a website, Beyond Same-Sex Marriage, big, long list of petition signers and so forth, broad coalition of people on the left. They see same-sex marriage as the chance for them 
to uh, to fundamentally reshape that that male female based marriage bond and create create all sorts of additional forms of marriage. I tell people all the time, my problem is far less with um, same sex marriage than it is with the fact that what same sex marriage does is it finally allows at a legal level the ability to break the mold of male female marriage that has sustained society for thousands of years. Once you break that mold, that then you're open to all sorts of new configurations and arrangements, of which same-sex marriage is just one. I think that the best thing for a child is a home with a mom and a dad. That should be what everybody strives for. And by the way, the left totally agreed with me on that for a while. There was this blessed moment in the 1990s, the National Fatherhood Initiative, Bill Clinton. In fact, I start the opening of this book by quoting a wonderful, beautiful Father's Day speech in 2007 by a senator by the name of Barack Obama on how important it is to have dads at home. The left agreed with this, but now the left is actually supporting fatherless homes because a female-female marriage will be a home without a dad. In fact, it's crazier than that. They're supporting motherless homes because a male-male marriage will be a marriage without a mom. So, so this, is, this is entirely new ground. But there are people on the left who um, want to break this ground so that they can create other forms of configurations of marriage. Again, beyond same-sex marriage. Two last slides. Paula Edelbrick, former legal director of Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, Quote, being queer means pushing the parameters of sex, sexuality, and family and transforming the very fabric of society. Transforming the very fabric of society is a big deal. We must keep our eyes on the goals of providing true alternatives to marriage and of radically reordering society's view of reality. Radically reordering. All right, that's big stuff. Masha Gessen, the writer, author, and gay rights activist, it's a no-brainer that homosexuals should have the right to marry, but I also think equally it's a no-brainer that the institution of marriage should not exist. Fighting for gay marriage generally involves lying about what we're going to do with marriage when we get there. Look, I'm not trying to change that. That's done. Again, my point is, you know, by redefining the original standard for marriage, you're opening the door to all sorts of, and I warn people on the left, this is going to lead to arrangements that you don't like, all right, that you don't like. And, and you will have made it possible, though, by breaking that original mold, all right? It won't be my fault, right? Fighting for gay marriage generally involves lying about what we're going to do with marriage when we get there because we lie that the institution of marriage is not going to change, and that is a lie. Well, of course, right? You're changing it. You're redefining marriage. You're changing it. The institution of marriage is going to change, and I think it should change. And again, I don't think it should exist. She said, I don't like lying and creating fictions in my life. She said, that's not why I came out of the closet a few years ago. Listen to this final statement from her. I have three kids who have five parents, more or less, and I don't see why they shouldn't have five parents legally. Check out the piece at the Ruth Institute, Jennifer Roback Morse's website, from a, from a, a girl who wrote, uh, Masha Gessen, I, I had five parents and it sucked. All right? It's not fun to have five parents. It's very confusing for a little child. I have three kids who have five parents, more or less. I don't see why they shouldn't have five parents legally. I met my new partner. She just had a baby, and that baby's biological father is my brother. And my daughter's biological father is a man who lives in Russia. And my adopted son also considers himself his father. So the five parents break down into groups of three. You kind of need a board to outline this. <laughs> And really, I would like to live in a legal system that's capable of reflecting that reality. And I don't think that's compatible with the institution of marriage. I'm not saying that all these people can't love the child, right? But you know, the most stable thing for society, for people, has always been a kid with a mom and a dad. And let me add here, too, because I know there's probably gay people yelling at the TV that are watching this on, on C-SPAN. 
uh, you, you know, th this is, they'll point out, hey, uh, you know, you Christians, Ken Gore, you did a pretty darn good job yourself of uh, screwing up marriage. You're right. Totally. Absolutely. No question about that. No question about it. And, and uh, we've desacramentalized, desacredized marriage. No question, no question about that. However, all right, out of the last 2,000 years, male-female marriage did really, really, really well for about 1,980 of them, okay? And these recent self-inflicted wounds to marriage are a, a blip on the historical radar. But even with as much as Christians and other people and heterosexuals have screwed up marriage, they didn't redefine it. They didn't break the mold. What's so different about same-sex marriage is it redefines it. And once you've decided that you have the ability to redefine it and to call marriage, which always only meant a male-female bond, once you feel that you can redefine these terms and call them whatever you want, as Anthony Kennedy does. Anthony Kennedy did that in 1992, KCV Planned Parenthood with a mystery clause where he said that being an American, liberty in America, means coming up with your own meanings of meaning, your own definitions of life, mystery, right, the universe, while also being an American today means coming up with your own definition of, of marriage. There's a danger in that, right? Again, I tell people on the left, look beyond same-sex marriage. My problem is less with that than the redefinition that this will allow. Wrap up. Am I done here? Uh, yeah, okay, this is the last slide real quick. What's so shockingly different about today's people who are redefining and reshaping marriage as compared and the, the people who are attacking the natural traditional standard, um, the typical same-sex marriage supporter today and the new left Marxist of the 60s, the cultural Marxists of the 30s, Marx and Engels, what do they all share in common? Not that they're all communists. What they all share in common is the notion that there is not a fixed, natural, traditional, biblical absolute for marriage and family. They all believe, no matter where they are, communist, far leftist or not, that they themselves can redefine these things and, and give them their, they all share that in common. And what, for the far left, they are absolutely beside themselves and thrilled, shocked, shocked, but thrilled exuberance that they finally, for the first time ever, have mainstream public support for their ideas to take down the natural, traditional, and biblical family. In the past, their ideas put them under government surveillance in the countries that they were in, and people considered them crazy extremists. But now, for the first time ever, they have the, they have the support of the, of the majority population. And get this, and the people who oppose them, especially for religious reasons, they are called the extremists, the fanatics the outliers. So I must say to the people on the far left, I congratulate you. I mean, this is a, a remarkable coup. This is a remarkable accomplishment. Um, you've done it. You've pulled it off. And uh, it's been a long time coming, but you did it. All right. Thank you very much. Happy to take your questions. Yes. Who do we got? We got a mic right there. Okay. Go there first. As always, it's great to hear from you. Thank you. This redefinition of marriage, do you see it as leading to a division between the communists who are advocating for the abolition of marriage and those who are advocating for more open definitions of marriage? And what do you think would, the response would be by either party to that? Well, I, I think generally that the when, um, when marriage ceases to have like a, a single definition, and can mean anything to anyone, and everyone can have their own definition. You've got the dictatorship of relativism. I don't think that strengthens marriage at all. I think that at some point it makes marriage almost meaningless to where you could have so many different conventions and understandings. I should, put, I should add here too as well that, um, again, for, for gay people who, who, are, who, are, who are listening, the um, heterosexuals, also separated the procreative function from, from marriage. And so, so gay people will say, look, you heterosexuals, don't give me this jive about how marriage is about reproduction. It's not. 
Uh, for some it is. So, you know, don't tell us that to be married is about reproduction. Um, you know, we don't have to have, and, that, and that's true. That's, that's, that's absolutely right. So, uh, you know, again, heterosexuals have done a really good job of, of screwing up marriage them, themselves. But there's a real danger here in breaking the mold and, and read Justice Kennedy's decision, do a little bit of Googling on it, and you'll find that very, very, very quickly, people were posting things on different websites saying that by Kennedy's definition, you cannot deny um, that man and three women in Montana or wherever that now want their marriage equality. They now want their marriage rights. And those people are saying, wait a second, if love wins, well, there's three of us here, we love each other. If consenting adults should be allowed to form a marriage, we're consenting adults, we all agree. I'm not forcing the two women here. They're not for, you know, where are our marriage rights? Where is our mar marriage? Are you saying that our love is illegitimate? And we have kids or we want to have kids. Are you saying to them that our love, our marriage is, is illegitimate? So by using that exact same rationale, that exact same thinking, you cannot deny the, that, that group marriage. You can't. And, and you're also using, again, using that same language and that same standard. You're not going to be able to deny the Muslim man who wants four wives. I mean, he's, he's going to be able to point, to point to that same logic. And when that happens, I know you'll try to establish some boundaries, but it'll be too late because you'll, you'll have broken the mold. And it will not have been my fault <laughs> because I'm arguing for, you know, the male-female standard that's been around for, for 2,000 years. I know a lot of religious folks don't like to see this, but um, I say all the time that you wouldn't have this church-state acrimony and this battle with religious believers if um, gays had done civil unions. Now, I know gay people say, well, yeah, but, um, you know, Ken Gore, you and a lot of your conservative Christian buddies don't support that either. Well, maybe not, maybe not religiously speaking, but certainly at a, at a legal level, uh, you know, what, what, what's, what's made this su such a, a battleground with Christians and you know, people like Kim Davis and others, and Kim Davis is different because she's actual law, actual clerk who gives out marriage licenses, but certainly the baker, the photographer and, and folks like that is, is that for them, they believe that marriage was ordained by their creator, by God. They believe that they have no right to redefine it. They think that they would be sinning, blaspheming their God if they rendered unto themselves, if they arrogated unto themselves the ability to do something that was the unique province of the laws of nature and nature's God. I mean, when I pass into the next world, I got enough to answer for. I don't want to have to stand up there and say, well, and I also redefined your marriage stuff while, while I was at it. You know, they, they, you know they, they believe that they don't have the right to do that. And, and if you really believe in tolerance and diversity, you ought to respect the right to disagree and not call them all kinds of names. That's just not right. Right? Um, and, and by the way, as a Christian, I believe in tolerance too. I call it charity. And, and my charity also means that I think it is sinful to persecute, attack, or hurt people because of their same-sex attraction. So it's my same Christian belief system that condemns that, but also tells me that I can't redefine marriage. So be real careful about wanting to attack my religious faith, because it also does things that leads to genuine tolerance to people whose sexual lifestyles that I disagree with. Another question. Um, down here? Yes. It'll pick it up on, yes, thank you. You may have mentioned this because I came in late, uh, that it's now uh, something that same-sex partners do is they're going into foster homes and adopting and just moving in on the foster children that are throughout the country. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, same-sex same adoption. That is, um, I think that's, um, Ann Hendershaw wrote a piece for Crisis Magazine on this. I think that might have been a motivation in one of uh, Putin's, one of Putin's reasons for trying to ban adoption of Russian children in, in the United States. He had other reasons, and it had to do with political, and I've written on, on this as well. Please do research on it. There's a number of different layers to why Putin did what he did. But among other things, I think Putin also wants more Russian children to stay in Russia because of the, the infertility problem. 
but um, yeah, that too, that, and that's a redefinition of, of the family as well. Uh, by the way, Pope Francis, who again, just came to the United States, when he was Cardinal Bergoglio in, in Argentina, um, called same-sex adoption and same-sex marriage, quote, a product of the father of lies, unquote. And just Google Pope Francis, National Catholic Register, father of lies. And, um, you know, liberals, you'll find that this man has a lot of views on marriage that you don't like at all. But again, he's also very tolerant, huh, charitable toward people of same-sex attraction. Okay, see, he's got certain standards, and his standards on religion tells him he can't support same-sex adoption or marriage. But his faith also tells him that he must be charitable and merciful and loving to people that he disagrees with. Yes, over here. Al Milliken, AM Media. Uh, what is your viewpoint on someone like uh, uh, David Horowitz? Uh, I, I did find it significant when I was having a conversation with uh, Bill Ayers, the, the disgust that he held him in, uh, which I, I know they used to be uh, friends and colleagues, comrades. Yeah, uh, Horowitz and, and Ayers yes. in, in particular. Oh, yeah, I mean, Horowitz is obviously completely broken with all of them. Um, I quote Horowitz a number of times in, in this book, and uh, Ron Radosh as well, two excellent, outstanding former communists who do just such great, great work today. And uh, few people knew uh, that side, the SDS, Weather Underground, 60s New Left, like Horowitz and Ron Radosh. I recommend any of their books. Radosh's Commies his memoir, and Horowitz, a Destructive Generation, Radical Son. So, but uh, yeah, they, they saw all of this. And Horowitz and Radosh understand, too, the difference between the old communists, the more orthodox, class-based, economic-based Communist Party USA types, and the new left, 60s communists. And you have to understand, again, this cultural Marxist element. That's where things really change. All right, that's why I, I, I beg people on the left, don't caricature my argument. Don't simplify it. I mean, you, there's, there's, this, there's this trajectory, right, that goes from 1800, early 1800s up to today. Uh, people don't just wake up one day and, you know, walk out of Starbucks and, and you know, and, and redefine the institution of marriage. I mean, there had to be chipping away at different parts of this over and over and over again, right? Uh, you don't just wake up and one day completely reject as hatred the views on marriage and family that was held by your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, your great-great-great-grandparents, your great-great-great-great-great-grand... Do I need to go on? Should I belabor this point? I think maybe I should. Great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. They're not all just wild hate mongers and homophobes, all right? I mean, people have reasons for the, re for the you know, it, 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 it's so cruel to just simplify all of this stuff and attack the people who disagree with, and, and two, not only am I a Christian, a very Orthodox Roman Catholic, really, if you want to know my views on marriage and family, it's Pope Francis's views perfectly, um, but the, uh, it, it, but the, as a conservative, you know, conservatives believe in conserving and preserving, and there's nothing more elemental and fundamental to society than the family. You would not expect a conservative to just wake up one day and say, well, let's redefine marriage. You would expect a progressive to do that. I, I mean, you know, what does progressive mean? It means they're always changing. They're always evolving, which also, by the way, means that progressives, liberals, 20 years ago, right, the vast majority of the Democratic Party supported the Defense of Marriage Act. So did both Clintons, right? Barack Obama did just a few years ago, right? That was on male-female marriage. Now, 20 years later, they've all changed. And if we continue to hold the position that they did, which was the posi position of all of our ancestors for 2,000 years, we're called the extremists. You say, wait a second, wait a second, we have your position that you all held on marriage. And I did. were you guys haters then? Right? And what this also means that is if you ask them, okay, hey, it's 2015. 
what will your position on marriage be in 2035? Will you support marriage between a man and three women? Or would you support a three-woman marriage? And right now, they might be yelling, no, no, we don't support that. Okay, well, but, but the truth is, you don't know what your position is going to be in 2035 because the essence of the progressive is that things are always changing. They're always progressing. They're always evolving. Margaret Sanger writes for The Nation in 1932 that there's nothing more awful than abortion. We do not support abortion. Now today, Planned Parenthood is America's largest abortion provider. And if you don't support it with your tax dollars, then you hate women. So they're always changing. You know what the, you know what the progressive position will be on marriage in 2035? They'll tell you when they get there. They don't know what it will be now either. They'll tell you when they get there. But you can be sure of this. When they get there, and it's different, if you, and it will be, if you don't support their position, they'll call you the wildest extremist. That's what they do. Yes. Last question? Okay, last question. Right. And trying to um, revitalize traditional marriage because, you know, they know what actually happens when the fathers disappear, which is kids go to jail at a far higher rate and become vastly less likely yeah. to go to college. This was Barack Obama's point in his Father's Day speech, June 2000. Yeah. Kids need dads. Right. Right. I like when I'm with lefties, I like quoting Barack Obama's figure. Yeah, and kids without the father are five times more likely to drop out of high school. Right, and eight times more likely to go to jail. Right, leaving aside Ebony and its peers. And, and by the way, we haven't even seen like what will what will a whole bunch of homes without moms be like? I mean, we've seen we have the data on what homes without dads are like, and that's been that's been really bad. Go ahead. But, I'm sorry. Um, leaving aside Ebony and some similar publications, are there any other liberal? Um, elements who want to who realize the real consequences of dissolving traditional marriage and fatherhood and who want to bring the fathers back into the family. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, again, Bill Clinton and those guys were arguing this in the 1990s. And, uh, you know, the, the left was arguing this and the importance of dads, but that's all been thrown under the bus with the push for the for this for the same sex marriage movement. So the argument now on the importance of dads at home has to be pushed aside in order to be able to argue for, for, for same-sex marriage. And I, and I would add here too, and by the way, none of this is to say that same-sex parents um, can't love a child. Of course they can. And none of this is to say that the kid won't grow up and say, I didn't love my parents, right? Uh, and and you know, people will say too, uh, look, if you have um, same-sex parents can, can provide the roof over the child's head, they can love the children, they can get them and pay for their college, they can take, a, true, of, of course, no one's denying any of that. By the way, if that's the case, why not a three or four person marriage? I mean, a four person marriage, you could really get the kids to and from soccer practice, all right? You could really have people helping to put the kids in bed. You'll really have money for the college education, right? You, you double the, 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 the workload. I mean, you've got it really covered with, with that. So if your definition is strictly a function, again, of um, that people can love and what they can provide or that they love each other. Y you can't use those arguments and, and, and prohibit the, the multi-person marriage. And, 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 and liberals, you're the one that's going to have to tell the multi-person marriage, according to your own standards, why they can't do it. My standard will be the same as it is now. I think the best thing for a child is, uh, is one mother and one father at home, and that's what public policy sh should strive for. Okay, I need to stop. Thank you. And please, again, feel free to email me. Please be nice.